When this happened in 2016, this community didn't exist. So in 2016, when this happened, all everybody was just sitting al alone, not knowing who on their street they should be talking to, not not knowing that they could sign on to a Zoom with a hundred or thousands of women who all felt exactly the same way they did. And because of the work that everybody did, that this space is built now. Welcome to the Suburban Women Problem, a podcast from Red, Wine, and Blue. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Amanda Weinstein. I'm Jasmine Clark. I'm Rachel Vindman. And this is the Suburban Women Problem. Ooh, do we have a problem today, ladies? Yes, uh, the do. news... The news from last night is so hard, and whatever you're feeling, whether it's grief, anger, disbelief, anything else, all of the above is also an appropriate response. We are all still processing this too, but we wanted to reach out to let you know that you're not alone. We are here to process with you, and thank you so much to every one of you for stepping up, having conversations, and getting involved. You may not feel like it, but it made a difference. We're recording this on Wednesday, the day after the election, and we're joined by Jess McIntosh. Jess, I am so glad you're here to help us make sense of this and work through our feelings. You're a political therapist today. Oh, no. my. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I said yes to this a week ago. I, I don't know if I can do it anymore. I uh... Oh, no, I mean, like I've been working, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years and I've, I've never seen a, I've never seen a cycle like this. Uh, I did not anticipate this ending. Um, I feel like I was a lot more like, you know, I was a Hillary Clinton staffer in 2016. I was one of her senior communications uh, folks and I was really pretty positive that we were going to win that night. I was much less positive uh, going in, going in this time. Um, I don't think that the shock and surprise are there in the same way that they were before. Um, although even still, I thought I thought we would get the popular vote and I thought there was a very good chance that we would lose because he would get the Electoral College. But I, I really did think that we would get the popular vote. I thought we did. And those too. numbers aren't in entirely yet, but it does. That's true. Like. No, I don't think we're going to get the popular vote. Um, but before we get into more of that bad news, let's start with good news. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will say Casey, my husband won by 12 percentage points. Great margin. He did huge. fantastic here in That's Ohio. Huge. That's huge. Uh, Jasmine, you have some good news for us. What's your good news, Jasmine? Yes, I also won. <laughs> um, and, uh, honestly, we overperformed or outperformed the expectations, um, which actually feels weird to say on a night oh. or, you know, on that night, considering everything else that happened. Um, but even in my district, like we did, we, we showed up for Kamala. <laughs> I just want to say that um, the district uh, just, and I, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but I know some people have told me like hearing some good news has been good for them. So I do want to point mm -hmm. out um, I have 17 precincts in my district including two that they drew into my district specifically because they were red precincts that would basically make it harder for me to win. And when I say red, these precincts were solidly red precincts in 2020. Um, both of them did not even go for the presidential or did not go for Biden in 2020 this year. Both of them, not only did we win them, but they shifted from solid bright red to solid blue. Nice work. So, Can we put you in charge of everything? Yes. How do we do that? <laughs> it was not. Well, so it was not luck. It was definitely, definitely, definitely the fact that we were so freaked out by it that we spent so much time in those areas, canvassing those areas for literal months, like literal months of just like going there, knocking as many doors as possible, trying to get as many votes as possible. Um, and I know we're going to get into it and I know Jess, you're going to do all your thing, but I think there's something to be said about how redistricting and gerrymandering affects the top of the ticket mm -hmm. that we don't talk about. 
And that is when you draw a whole bunch of safe seats, those people don't campaign. When you draw people into competitive seats, they get out there and they knock doors. Have the conversation. And when it comes to turnout and a thing where you need a bunch of people to turn out, I wonder, I don't know, Jess, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. I wonder how well Kamala did in areas where there's a safe Democrat who didn't have to knock a single door because they knew they were going to win anyway. I know her numbers are down in like Manhattan and Brooklyn, which would go to support your thesis for sure. I saw that. I think gerrymandering is a big problem for lots and lots of reasons, including just like the national conversation making it crazier. So like that affects the top of the ticket a ton. Yeah. I just wonder, I mean, I don't know. I, I One day maybe I'll take, take some time and dig a little deeper, but I just wonder if when we think about redistricting and we think about gerrymandering, we always think about it as who it affects at that level and not how it affects behavior for national elections. So anyway, I think, I think it's time for us to kind of, I guess, get into this thing that we have to get into. Um, More talk about Jerry. Well, Eugene also won, right? Oh, Rachel? Yeah, Rachel. He did. Yes. It doesn't look like it's official, but it is. I mean, it, All right. he's the votes, maybe his his opponent hasn't conceded, I will say that, but um, he also can't win with the votes that maybe are some remaining, but they're not enough votes to win. So, yeah. And I mean, I'll tell you, Jasmine, this was the district that was redistricted and 22 for the midterms. And um, it's a tight seat. You know, it was always going to be very tight, Virginia 7. It took a lot of work, but with a lot of work and a lot of conversations, it was still close. But there was never a day off. And I think that matters. I mean, you know, I just think it because you see in places like this where they're really outperforming at the top of the ticket. And I, you know, I don't know. I, well, here we have Jess. She's an expert. So let's. <laughs> well, I want to say congratulations to all three of your households. Um, there actually were a lot of wins last night. Like I know we're all overwhelmed with what happened at the top of the ticket. I certainly am. I don't want to try to pretend that I'm like sugarcoating things here, but this isn't sugarcoating. Mm -hmm. It is reality. Like, the North Carolina governor, North Carolina had an incredible night last night with the exception of the top of the ticket. They saved their school yeah. system from being run by one of the worst extremists I've ever yeah. seen run for office oh, anywhere in the country. They defeated Mark Robinson. They broke the GOP supermajority. In Michigan, we're looking at like 75% of extremist Moms for Liberty school board candidates have lost. That is enormous. Um, we see the for the first time, we're going to have two black women in the Senate at the same time. Ooh. I didn't even hear this part. Yeah. I know. I didn't hear this part either. Angela Lassavax and, and Lisa Blunt Rochester from Maryland and Delaware uh, are going together. Um, they are both fantastic. I've been watching both of those women for a very, very long time. Those are really exciting voices to have there. And in Maryland and Delaware, they might stay there for a minute, which would be really cool. Um, we have Sarah McBride from Delaware as the first openly transgender person in Congress ever, uh, which considering all of the conversation around there the might rhetoric. be useful to yeah. have somebody from that actual community as a part of it. So that's going to happen now. So, I, I mean, abortion won almost everywhere. Uh, it didn't win in Florida, but that's only because they set an impossible 60% standard. Exactly. Yes. It yeah. won. It just didn't win. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 1.5 million more people in Florida voted, voted for abortion access than against it. That ought to be a win in a democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, but Florida is Florida. And so it was not. Otherwise, Nebraska lost, and that is because they had they had two competing abortion ballot initiatives, both of which had really confusing language. So, like, I'm I'm going to go ahead and call shenanigans on that one. And then South Dakota, is South Dakota, but it 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 passed in the other seven places that it was up. So, like, you know, last night was kind of the house is still out. We we actually don't know what happened what happened there. We might still you know we might we might flip that chamber. So it's, yeah, it's not, it's not a total, like, it's not like there's nothing to point to as evidence of progress. Um, but I don't want, I like, I don't want to sugarcoat it. You can know? I, oh yeah. I can be the Debbie Downer here. Here's what, 
I'm a little worried about, I'm so proud of all the states that voted to protect women's reproductive freedom. It might all be for not with who we elected for president. Right. Thank you. So let's just handle expectations right there. I I also want to uh, talk a little bit more because I don't know, maybe I was just listening to the wrong people and that's very possible. I thought that uh, the House had already been decided. So I thought we were still, did we still didn't have a House. So actually, even though I guess like right now I'm a little... Um, cautious about hoping for anything. Um, but the, I guess there is something to, cause my, my, one of my biggest concerns is like, not this guy at the top with a house and a Senate and a Supreme court, like it's rough. that mm-hmm. scared the crap out of me. And I, and I know that could still be a possibility, but I also like the idea that there might be a possibility that maybe that won't happen. Um, I don't know. And and the thing I will say is the house at least runs every two years. So even if that does happen, I do hope that we see the same type of, and Jess, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of like a, usually the person who's in office loses the, that chamber, like in their midterms. I hope we, at least if we get the margin so close that we only need a few seats to flip it, I hope that there's some hope either now or in 2026, which means we need to start talking about 2026, like now ASAP. Well, maybe we give ourselves a week okay. and then we start talking about 2026 and may immediately yeah. because we have to literally educate voters that there is an election in two years. And I really think that starts way before January in 2026. We, we, we need to keep community organizing is the thing that's, that's, that's got to happen. And it'll, it'll take on a mutual aid um, perspective now. We have a lot of folks who are rightfully going to be very scared about what a Trump presidency means for them and their families. Um, and we need to be showing up for them as they attempt to implement Project 2025 across the country. Um, we need to we need to be there. Uh, and that turns into electoral organizing as well. You know, it matters that these extremist school board candidates lost because when he goes after the Department of Ed, uh, they're going to be the front lines for these kids. So the work that you all did this year, like it might not have appeared at the top of the ticket in that outcome, but things would be so much worse without the multiracial coalition that was built, um, without the conversations that were had, like like with, without the wins that happened down the ticket, without the education. I mean, how much more do you all know about, or does your audience know about how our government works than they did a year ago? Like, we know to fight for state Supreme Court seats now. You know, people don't know what the filibuster is. They know what the Electoral College does. Like, it's... People are learning this stuff and it's, you know, it's going to be a longer slog than we hoped it was going to be. I'm, I'm tired and I'm sure that you all are too. I, one of my favorite authors today, uh, Saeed Jones put out a nice little newsletter that said, everybody needs to take the day and mope and wallow and scream and whatever it is you need. And if you are black, that extends through the weekend. Thank you. But I once we are that. done, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, like, let's take a minute. Like, black women did uh, uh, once again ninety-two percent or something like that. Some clapping. I, can, Good job. I mean, Good job, why, ladies. Why we can we use some tips just... for next time. White women, we we're not pulling our weight. We're not, we're not pulling our weight here. We have plenty more conversations to have with white women in so, the suburbs. Here's my. What's the deal with that? Why? What happened? Well, we we don't know. We don't know exact. We don't know voter turnout numbers for real yet. And in 2020, the, the story was dramatically different after we got the actual numbers back. So right now we're looking yeah. at exit polling. However, it very much seems like white women did not get over 50% for Kamala Harris. It seems like we're more in the same camp that we were in 2016 and 2020, which is about a, a 52-48 split uh, for Republicans. But there has been a dramatic demographic shift there um, when it comes to education. So we have Democrats have gained tons and tons of white women with college degrees. 
enormous shift. You're see, that's a lot of the suburban women that you're talking about. Um, also, single white women uh, turned out in huge numbers, um, huge percentages for for Vice President Harris. So what you're seeing is that there are a lot of married white women who are married to MAGA guys, and they are standing with them. Um, that's just you know party Trump's gender. You are more likely to vote Republican if you are a Republican. You're more likely to vote Democrat if you are a Democrat. That sounds like dumb and obvious. But when we start saying you should vote, you know, well, you're going to vote Democrat because you're black or you're going to vote Republican because you're a white woman. Like, no, it's really it's about it's about your party affiliation. <laughs> and that's I love what, what you said about the conversations that we've been having are worth it. The work that we've been doing is worth it. And there's more week we could be work we could be doing with more women, uh, more white women, more people in the suburbs. However, I think a big story is also that our country just continues down the political polarization road. We are each in our political bubbles, increasingly so. So how do we cross those geographic boundaries or that bubble boundaries to start having more conversations with people who don't live by us, who live in another area? Or how do we support the Dems, the few Dems that are in that area? Then it seems like that just having conversations with our own district isn't going to work as we become more polarized. Yeah, I mean, the 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 fractured media landscape is a really big problem. Yeah. You know, the, the fact that a full third of America receives news that is just like it's mm. unintelligible to the rest of us. If you were to turn it's a whole other world, whole just other when I watch my, them. they're talking of oh, what even the conversations they have, the topics they bring up are completely different. Yep. So it's about talking to like, I, you know, it's annoying to say it's about the work that we've been doing because the work that we've been doing didn't get us where we wanted to go this time. But the only people who are going to reach those people are the people they already know and trust. And that means that the daughters and the nieces and the wives where they are so inclined, um, they have work to do. Uh, and it's going to take a while. And the rest of us need to do whatever we can do to convince people that we have their backs, that we care about them and their lives, that we're standing up for them. Um, and our candidates need to do the same. You know, I think Vice President Harris ran an incredible campaign. And let's just be clear, she did. She had 107 days where like the guys get two years. Um, she didn't get to build infrastructure. None of none of, none of the normal campaign stuff happened. You know, the 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 primary is where you test yourself it's where you introduce yourself to voters it's you know the vast majority of america oh, still that's a great point so we are i mean amy deal talks about this but in a business setting is that we very often put women on what she calls a glass cliff when a company is doing very bad and watch it you'll start to see it they name a woman as ceo because what because it's hard to turn a company around and you don't do it in a year or two years it takes time and when she can't do it in magically six months, we're going to blame her and it's her fault. So it's this glass cliff. We're more than ready to push women off of, which is a little bit, I think, what happened here is we put Kamala on a glass cliff and we pushed her off. Mm -hmm. uh, do y'all not realize, though, we kind of had that conversation when she first announced that this was a possibility, like, yeah, this was like one of the things that people were saying is like, we wanted her to be the nominee because she was in the best position, you know, all things considered, but also she would make the great, it would make it a lot easier to be like, there's those black women underperforming again in, in life because she didn't, you know, bring home the gold. If she had brought home the gold, everyone would have been happy. Yeah. But then if she doesn't, it just turns into like the scapegoat of, oh, well, she wasn't this. She wasn't that. She wasn't qualified. All the things that they said. And so I would love to listen to the the rhetoric that comes out over the next couple of weeks as people start, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking, Oof. you know, what oh, happened? Oh, no. Let's be clear. If she had brought home the gold, we would be saying what a great job she did reaching out to Dick Cheney and Republicans Absolutely. and we would be crediting them with her win. So there is no scenario where Vice President Harris gets the credit for being qualified and running a virtually error-free campaign, yeah. win or loss, yeah. that 
doesn't. No, of which, let's be clear, she was hands down the most qualified candidate for any Absolutely. issue on that anyone is talking about, right or left. Ran a fantastic campaign, in my opinion. So if we want to talk about stuff, to me, if we really want to analyze it, we need to be talking about voters. So I have a question. Uh, I'm... I'm just really shocked. I was shocked last night. I continued to be shocked uh, in that she had the momentum. Yes, the stadium. The I, I follow a couple of data kids. They're very young. There are some of my favorite ones. They're really young and they were like, and, they, and I was, I didn't say it to them, but I kept thinking you're missing something because you're, you know, it was all data, which I get like they're statisticians. And, but in the end, they were right. Because they were, you know, making models based on polls and the polling was right. People say the polling wasn't. I've heard people say the polling wasn't right, but actually it was. It was tight. And I'm like, she had 75,000 people on the mall last week, on the ellipse that spilled out onto the mall. And there was such enthusiasm. And then Democrats showed up 32%, Republicans 34 and Independents 34. Like we didn't even show up. And I... I don't understand. I'm I'm totally at a loss. Yeah, and I think that's I mean that's that's what people are going to be unpacking for a long time. Um it could not be more disappointing. Um not just that that we didn't make the numbers that we thought we were going to make in terms of turnout, but um what what happened with men, you know? Uh, we've never seen young men break right like Gen Z did. That was very surprising. Um, the exit polling would suggest that Latinos went through like a 20 point swing. Um, Which does make, that makes no sense to me though. I'm sorry. Especially with the, final, with the yeah. final messaging of Puerto Rico being a garbage island and the rest of it, it just like, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't compute. Um, I never want to hear anything about black women and underperforming in the same sentence ever again. I don't care if we're talking about the top of the ticket or voters. It is just so clear that black women are the, I mean, they've always been the leaders of our movement whatever the movement for social justice or progressive causes, or it's led by black women always has been this year. I felt like we finally noticed that we were being led by black women and, and we're a you know, that win with black women call that happened as soon as Harris was the, the nominee that kicked us off. That gave us our marching orders. That was, you know, that was sort of everything. And we need to not lose that. Like we need to, we need to not scrap that because we lost this election. We need to look at that, those voter turnout numbers. Look at that 92% black women who showed up for their communities, whether their communities showed up for them or not, and and learn from that and and keep listening to them and keep fighting. I agree with you 100%. And I, I think, like, to your point, I'm like trying to figure out the numbers. So Donald Trump did not get as many votes as he got in 2020. So there definitely were people that said, I will not vote for Trump again. So the, it really was our side. I just, I don't know, something, it's something happened on our side mm -hmm. because I feel like those people who said, I will not vote for Trump again, they didn't just, they didn't switch, which I think we were trying to count on like, oh, we'll get them. I think they just skipped her. I mean, they skipped that race. Meanwhile, where we had over 80 million people vote for Biden, but she only got 60 something million. Like, where are these, where are these people? I mean, I I think it's, he's always outperformed his polling, which is just bizarre to me. And we saw it again for oh. the third time. But I'm just, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to be processing this for a while. People don't want to admit yeah. to it. They know, they know he's a bad guy. They don't want to admit to a polling person that they're going to vote for him. And that is an issue. So saying he's a bad guy isn't going to sway a vote. We already know. They're, they're too ashamed to even say they're going to vote for him. Like, we know he's a bad guy. Well, there, yeah, there are a lot of people who knew exactly what they were voting for, and they did it on purpose. And we're going to hear a lot about disinformation, and we should talk about disinformation. We should talk about the the, the what the social media platforms did to enable this. Like, there, there's a lot of layers here. Anybody who tells you that Kamala Harris lost because of X is being reductive. Like, that is just not, like, Kamala Harris lost because of sexism, because of racism, because of Twitter, because of Elon Musk, because of Wisconsin, because, like, there there are so many layers to this, and we're going we're going to need to have a more nuanced and thoughtful conversation than America usually has 
So I want to invite like our side of this conversation to start having it. Like mm -hmm. we're the resistance now. That's it. We're going to have to figure out how to keep as many people safe uh, as we possibly can in in the face of, of whatever is coming. And we need to try to make this dark period as short as we can. Um, it is really important to remember that social justice, you know, everybody's like, it's a marathon, it's a sprint. It's like, it's a relay race. You have the baton for a while. You run with it. You do your best with it. When you cannot run anymore, you pass it to the next generation and they will pick it up and they will run. So this is our turn with the baton. And we have a really weird one, guys. We got a weird turn with the baton. We are running over some rough, rough road. Like, it's not like, I just, I just want you to like picture the race towards justice and understand that we got the rocky uphill climb, yeah. but it's still our responsibility. It's on our backs right now. We have the baton. We will pass it off eventually, but right now we're running with it. And for those of you who are trying to figure out what to say to your kids, I just want to remind everybody, there were millions and millions of people who fought to keep them safe. And those people are still there. They are still their neighbors. They are still in their schools. They are still your friends. They still believe what they believe and they, they need your support and love more than ever. So, so tell the kids that like in every country where bad things happen, there are good people at every point in history, in every country on earth. And America right now is no exception. So we're just going to pull a, a little from Mr. Rogers and, and tell them to look for the helpers because you don't have to look far. You really, really don't. I was just thinking of the Mr. Rogers. And I'll just say from a really geeky, boring economist perspective, we know in this country, economic inequality has been widening. We know that geographic inequality has been widening. And there's really been nothing that has stopped it so far. And what that means is there is a good share of people that feel economically anxious, which makes it especially easy to pull the tactics that you see in like cast by Isabel Wilkerson and the opposite of the sum of us of a zero sum mindset. It makes it very easy and a very tempting message and finding that way forward of looking for the helpers and how can we get back to a message that speaks to more people, whether it's through the sum of us, how do we really know we're in this together? And we are actually better off if we're in this together. But I think for the next four years, we're going to get worse off. So let's just buckle up for that. I think the issue is really safety for a lot of us in a lot of different ways. And that's the really, that unknown part is the scary part how much were they serious about um, because they told us what they wanted to do. They even made a playbook as governor wall says, and that's, that's the really scary thing. So, and, and you know, another thing is, is I have, you know, I have a lot of anger towards the mainstream media and it's really hard because I saw the way they treated president Biden and I saw the way they treated vice president Harris and the questions they asked and the way they talked about her. And yet they never asked those questions of Donald Trump. Exactly. Yeah. It's just hard. It's all hard to process in light of the news from yesterday. But I think now more than ever, we are going to need a toast to Joy. Ladies. I do. I do think so. What? A hug. You we have a hug to Joy. To I don't know how that works on a podcast. But that's what I need right now. A 40 ounce to Joy. <laughs> Maybe it's not a toast yeah. today. <laughs> Jess, what have you got for us, political therapists? What toast to joy can we sit with? So my toast to joy is one that I hope everybody really takes to heart because you all share it. When this happened in 2016, this community didn't exist. This is true. So we had to build that infrastructure from scratch. There was no place to turn to we're a new little baby community pre still. pretty much I, I mean think about it yes that's like and that's that, it's incredible that you will provide this on-ramp for people who are thinking about politics for the first time red wine and blue is a, a place where where people can go and not know anything and and just care about their communities and that is welcomed and wanted that's a new space 
So in 2016, when this happened, all everybody was just sitting al- alone in their houses, in their neighborhoods, not knowing who on their street they should be talking to, not not knowing that they could sign on to a Zoom with a hundred or thousands of women who all felt exactly the same way they did. Um, and because of the work that everybody did, that this space is built now and we need it and we're going to put it to use. But you don't build an organizing space and then win, and then you're done. Like, that's that's not how the fight has ever worked, and it's not how it works now. But the gains that we made will make us stronger and will keep us safer and will will bend that arc. So so that my toast to joy is that this exists, and, and we need it, and it's here. I love that. We have lost the battle, not yet the war. Exactly. And this may be also hard for the new people. who This might be their first battle they've lost, and that's a hard... A hard first battle. Yep. That was pretty good. I don't know if I can match that. <laughs> My toast to joy. Um, I don't know, ladies. I think my toast to joy, though, is, uh, Jess, you talked about finding the helpers. I will say in my community and around, so my community is not bright blue. My neighborhood <laughs> is about 50-50. Um, And I think we handle this election pretty well, but I will say even in my community, when we get some of the worst attacks is also when you see some of the brightest bright spots of people coming to your defense. And, oh man, now I'm crying. Rachel, I'm blaming you for this one. (laughs) (laughs) That it really does mean so much to see people support you. And we got so many texts of congratulations today and that, you know, Casey's win was a bright spot for everyone. And that was wonderful. So there is just so much more good and so much more people that want good for this nation that want something else. And that is my bright spot. And I truly still believe that about this country. All right, Rachel, what is your toast to joy? It's a bit tough today. I feel that. Um, I'm so sad about the way things turned out, but I'm still really proud to be an American. And I understand that people have different feelings about it, but I still think this is a very special place and we've been through dark times before. I hope we come out of it. I'm not totally convinced, but I also haven't slept in a long time. So I haven't given it a lot of thought, but There is this innate pride. I'm not proud about what happened yesterday. But I think we are always moving towards a more perfect union. And and the news was shocking at the top of the ticket yesterday. But you can see we all got good news. There is some good news out there. And we do need to look for it and see it because I think it points to where we maybe aren't as we are divided. But it is not as one way. It's not overwhelming. And so we really have to focus on that. And um, and I hope once again, come together and, and work together and, and organize. And we have the infrastructure and, you know, when we need to use it. But I unfortunately think a lot of people are not going to get what they bargained for by the vote that they placed. And that opens up the opportunity for conversation and for us to to use democracy again, because I'm very worried about the future of democracy for sure. But I think she'll survive. I think she'll be okay. And I am proud to be in a democratic country. So, Jasmine? <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So y'all know... Uh, And I'm kind of piggybacking off of uh, what you just said, Rachel. You'll know that I am all about, and I say this a lot because I am, I'm a black woman who is in the state legislature where I've been in the minority the entire time. It is very difficult for us to get any type of win on anything. And especially with me being in a competitive district, they literally give me very little wins at all. But When I do get any inkling of a win, I celebrate my small victories. And so my toast to joy today is to celebrating the small victories, which feels hard to do right now. And I will be honest, 
everyone was texting me congratulations and oh my gosh, and you're a beacon and a dark day and a silver lining and all this stuff. And as much as I wanted to like be joyous and happy about my race, I just could not find the joy. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, you know what? I can celebrate the fact that there were some wins. The Georgia State House, we gained two seats despite everything else that happened last night. We did not lose any, we did not lose, we had a net gain of two seats. As y'all said, the the co- Congress is still up in the air, but even if it doesn't go our way, we got two years to fix that. And I think we would fix it in two years. Senate, like we finally have a, a black woman in the Senate, not just one, but two, like, wow, like that's amazing. And so I am trying to find more silver linings. A lot of people, a lot of this stuff that we're talking about, this is their first time hearing it. So come on, like, I'm just, I guess my toast is just to celebrating those small victories, no matter how small they feel right now in this moment. Cause I feel small, even though I should be jumping up and down. Yeah. It doesn't matter. We celebrate regardless because this thing ebbs and flows and some days it's going to be a great day. And some days it's going to freaking suck <laughs> yesterday and today really freaking sucks. But y'all, we be- we've built something here and it's not going to go away because of what happened yesterday. And so we're celebrating our small victories and we're taking that and we're using that as momentum and fire to move forward. Have, have you ever heard the phrase joy is resistance? I, I, I've heard that before and I never really got it until I found myself as a part of it. Like you have to celebrate the small things. Demoralization is a huge problem that we're going to have a lot of. It's yeah. kind of how strong men work. Like the, they, they, they want to break your spirit. They want to make you stop trying. They want to make you stop, stop trying to fight them. And one of the best ways to keep that up is community and joy. So celebrate your wins celebrate them louder than you would have if we had won the big prize yesterday. Um, Do whatever you can to cultivate your community, to take care of yourselves and each other. Your mental health matters more than ever. Joy is a huge part of that. Like that's, you know, that's how, that's how we're going to get through it. And that's, that's how we are eventually going to beat them. Sorry. I had someone come and bring me a little, it's really a small gesture. They brought me a, a coaster that says cheers on it because I guess it's like a little congratulations. I don't That's know. so sweet. Yes, exactly. I'm going to celebrate that. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on this special election recap episode. We're so grateful to have this community. Thanks again. And we'll see you again next week on another episode of the Suburban Women Problem. The Suburban Women Problem was created by Red, Wine, and Blue. Our producer and editor is Amy Thorstensen. Our project manager is Lindsay Quist. And our editorial assistant is Abigail Martin. For more information about upcoming events and trainings, or to learn more about Red, Wine, and Blue, follow us on social media or at www.redwine.blue.